This change we're seeing across the world, we feel it now. My name is Sunny Singh. I live in Brooklyn, New York City, and I'm a citizen of Habitat 3. Katy, soy de Napa, Ecuador, y soy ciudadana de Habitat 3. Je suis Thibaut de France et je suis un citoyen d'Habitat 3. An urban development of Cameroon in Central Africa. I'm city of Habitat 3. My name is Olivia Caldwell. I'm from the United States and France and I'm a citizen of Habitat 3. Dobar dan. Ja sam Ilija Gubić iz Srbije, Habitat 3 građani. Denis Muhammad. Flora Uzele. Nairobi, Kenya. We are Habitat 3 citizens. Habitat 3 citizens, together towards the implementation of the new urban agenda. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, welcome to implementing the new urban agenda. Before we get uh, much further along, just let you know that we will have uh, panelist presentations as well as opportunities for questions from the audience. And we will be using the ask and vote uh, technology. And so if you'd like, you can actually submit questions online. Um, we'll be using this tool called ask and vote that allows you to submit your questions and upvote the ones you like the most. Throughout the event, you'll also be able to express your opinion by rating a session in a poll that's been enabled for you. Um, so if you have a smartphone, I'd like to ask you first to put it on vibrate. Second, um, feel free to connect to the internet and open up SCEWC app and click on the Ask and Vote option. If you don't have the app, open your web browser and go to www.smartcityexpo.com slash ask and vote and you can find this session which is implementing the new urban agenda on that. And we ask you to feel free to submit questions as we go through uh, today's session. I am honored to actually be moderating this panel. I am Tom D'Alessio, President, CEO, and Publisher of Next City. We're a nonprofit organization with a mission to inspire social, economic, and environmental change in cities through journalism and events. We were at, uh, at Habitat 3 in Quito, as well as uh, at PrepCom 3 in Surabaya and a number of the other preparatory meetings. Um, I was also thrilled to be a member of one of the um, 200 experts that helped develop the new urban agenda through the policy group. If you'd like to find out more about the new urban agenda and about Habitat 3, feel free to go to our website, nextcity.org slash habitat and use the number three. So at this session, We'll be talking a bit about the new urban agenda, which is the action-oriented document recently adopted in Quito, Ecuador, at the United Nations Conference on Housing and Sustainable Development, or Habitat 3. The agenda rethinks the way we build, manage, and live in cities through drawing together cooperation and committed partners and urban actors at all levels of government, as well as the private sector. So for this session, we have a number of panelists who have been engaged in the new urban agenda, and we'd like to ask them for their thoughts. Each will have seven to 10 minutes for a presentation, and then we'll break into questions, and we'll ask for your comments and questions after that. First, I have the privilege and honor to introduce uh, Mr. Kumarish Misra, who is with uh, UN Habitat, and um, we'd like to ask him in particular to give us a further update on UN Habitat, um, in your guide, you'll see that uh, he is the Deputy Secretary General for the Habitat 3 Conference, and that prior to that, he was the head of the International Cooperation Branch at OPCW and worked in the civil service of India from the local district and city level to the policy level in the Prime Minister's office. And so uh, Mr. Misra will be able to tell us a bit about Habitat 3, the new urban agenda, and maybe what we can expect following that activity. Please. Thank you, Tom, for this introduction. And uh, thank you to all of you to have come to this session on implementing the new urban agenda. 
For me, it was indeed a great <clears throat> privilege to be part of the process of developing the new urban agenda. As you would all be aware that when we refer to Habitat 3, we think in the context of Habitat 1 in Vancouver in 1976, in terms of Habitat 2 in Istanbul in 1996, and now we are talking about Habitat 3, which just took place last month in Quito, Ecuador. Now what changed over the, <clears throat> over the two habitats and the current habitat? One, the urban population, the rate of urban population grew rapidly. In the first habitat, it was more in terms of habitat. The population was mostly rural. Second, it did increase. And third, it has crossed over 50%. And quite often, you know, when we, when we think we, earlier we talked about world being a global village. Now 54% of the population living in, living in urban area, the world has actually become a global city where the communication is much more between the citizens living in cities. So given this change which was taking place, and nobody managed it, the rush to urban, urban areas, the movement of population in urban areas, especially in developing countries, was something which was perhaps not anticipated at the level at which this increase has taken place. And what is happening more is that finally it has been accepted that you cannot stop urbanization. It's a process which is going on. Yes, in some parts of the developed world <clears throat> and in the Grulac region, the urban population is already above 70 to 80 percent. But when you talk of the developing world of Asia and Africa, where in parts it's still below 50 percent, but the rate at which urbanization is increasing everyone expects and sees it in reality that you have poverty levels increasing in urban areas, informal settlements are increasing in urban areas, housing has become a major challenge, economic activity is a major challenge, education, safety, especially of the vulnerable groups have become a major challenge and therefore <clears throat> when the Habitat 3 was mandated to take place in 2016, by the United Nations, it was a time for all the countries to come together, think and apply, how do we move forward? How do we have a new urban agenda which is going to be focused and action oriented? Because they realized not to do anything was not an option. And therefore the reality was that action had to be taken. Now what changed more in terms of when, <clears throat> when doing the Habitat 3 was that earlier it was predominantly the national government that decided and took action. When <clears throat> the movement came to Habitat 3, it was realized that the sole responsibility is not only with the national government. It has to come down to regional and local governments. Plus, the stakeholders had a much larger and a bigger role to play. That only governments cannot change, even if you agree on something. To make it, make it practical and make it happen, you have to involve the stakeholders. You have to involve the local governments. You have to involve the regional governments. And so when you look at the, <clears throat> the new urban agenda that has been adopted, and Last year I was here, in, perhaps in a similar room, and I think Tom was chairing that session. And I said, next year I was, I was inviting you to come to Quito and said, see you in Quito. This year, we have the new urban agenda. And all of you have supported the, <clears throat> the, the evolution of the new urban agenda in myriad ways as stakeholders, 
as citizens, as cities, through a very <clears throat> elaborate process in terms of the General Assembly of Partners, which brought the civil society, which brought the private sector, which brought the, the academia, the brought the, <clears throat> the, the women and, 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 and children groups. They, they, they were all brought together. Plus, through UCLG, the participation of the local governments, the mayors. And prior to that, <clears throat> what was also done was that sufficient knowledge base was also prepared. Through preparation of issue papers, which involved the various UN agencies. Then we also had the policy units, which prepared the policy papers as experts on various. So we had 10 policy papers. They're all on the website which have details in terms of the of developing of the uh, new urban agenda. And then once you had this knowledge, the negotiation process was extremely elaborate. It was not just limited to the government. So even when the governments were there, <clears throat> the civil society, the local governments, the stakeholders were all brought in to share their feelings and views and experiences in terms of the um, uh, the development and evolution of the new urban agenda. So whereas the, the government, the, the, the Bureau of, the, of Habitat 3 prepared the first draft, but it was very widely shared. And everyone is, was expected to give in their, uh, their, their views. And that came in. So it was intense negotiation in terms of the, um, of the third <clears throat> PrepCom, which took place in Surabaya in Indonesia, followed by another, because the, the negotiations were very intense. And even with this intense negotiation, it rolled over to New York, and you'd be surprised to know that the last negotiation, the last day of negotiation, went on continuously for 36 hours. On, on Thursday night, it ended at 1 o'clock. Next day on Friday, they started again at 10 o'clock. And it rolled over till Saturday, 4 o'clock, non-stop. And such was the intense interaction amongst the member states, amongst the stakeholders, putting their feedbacks. So after all this, we arrived at this new urban agenda. Now we have this new urban agenda. Is it binding? No, it is not binding. It's a commitment which every country, have, country and, and, and others have made. But it's not binding. And it's not self-executing. So we have to, it's a commitment from, from their side. <clears throat> but it won't happen on its own. And therefore, as we move from commitment to action, we need to keep up the enthusiasm, <clears throat> the way people have prepared and prepared a vision for a way forward in terms of new urban agenda. Now, what happened in Quito was really an expression of the hopes and aspirations and positive outlook of the stakeholders. And that you can see that <clears throat> there were, apart from the main plenary, over 1,000 events took place. And anybody who had a kind of a stake either went there personally or followed it in terms of the very <clears throat> various social media. There were over 30,000 registered participants in Quito. Over 10,000 of them were from foreign countries, from abroad, representing 167 countries. And <clears throat> anybody, those of you who were there, you would have seen the enthusiasm and the commitment and the hope and the aspiration which was there in Quito. And that builds up hope that the new urban agenda that, has, that, that is there will need to be followed up and executed. The enthusiasm and build up that has come about in terms of building this new urban agenda, this enthusiasm needs to be kept up. Because if the civil society is alert, if the various stakeholders are alert, that also builds pressure in terms of the local governments, the regional governments, and national governments to implement the new urban agenda. Now, new urban agenda is very comprehensive. As I said, said it is not self-executing. It won't implement itself. People have to take action. Now, if you look at the new urban agenda, it's very broad. 
because it tries to meet the need of cities which are in developed countries, cities which are in developing countries. <clears throat> Areas, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the contrast. Spain has a population of 47 million. 70 to 80% population are in urban areas. I come from a province in India which has a population of 110 million. What is the level of urbanization? 13%. So the new urban agenda looks at the developed world, the developing world, where urbanization level is very high, other places urbanization level is very low. At places where informal settlements are very high, at other places where informal settlements are not there. So it's a huge, diverse kind of situation. So when you look at this new urban agenda, it's a very comprehensive kind of an agenda that you have. And therefore what it implies, but it covers everything. It doesn't leave out anything. That, that, at least to my understanding, it covers almost all aspects and challenges of urbanization whether it is unemployment, the economy, the, the social aspect, the environment aspect, it's very, very comprehensive. But to convert into action, <clears throat> every city, every country does need to prepare an action plan in terms of an implementation plan. And therefore, the needs now <clears throat> in terms of looking at this new urban agenda is to prioritize and plan the implementation at the national level, and at the regional level, at the city level. And at the end, focus on implementation, implementation, implementation. That's the key challenge. Prioritize, plan, implement. Yes, there are issues of financing. <clears throat> the, the, but again, finance is always a challenge. But you have methods, means. Uh, there are references in the, in the new urban agenda in terms of handling the financial challenges, handling the social challenges, handling the environmental challenges. But as I finally I would just end by saying, there is no option but to ensure the implementation of the new urban agenda. If you really want to leave no one behind, if, really, if you really want to make cities safe, resilient and sustainable and inclusive, we need to implement this urban agenda. If we want a future where we will be proud in terms of <clears throat> leaving a legacy to, to the next generation, we have to implement the new urban agenda, uh, new, new urban agenda. And all of us, the way we have brought it to <clears throat> fruition in terms of the, our activism, it's our participation, uh, there is no other way. And finally, I, I, I do want to just share two paragraphs one, of course, in terms of, because of the context, uh, just Secretary very quickly, General, very quickly, in terms of actually, Para 66. I apologize. Do you mind if we actually hear from the other speakers so we can come back to that? No, just one quick. Okay. Smart city. There is a reference to smart city in Para 66. Refer to that. That we commit to adopt a smart city approach. So it's very relevant that what we did here last year or what this, uh, uh, this expo has been doing has also contributed to the new urban agenda. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Deputy Secretary General. We appreciate that address. I'd like to ask Mr. Costley Chanza to come forward. He is the Director of Town Planning and State Services at the Blantara City Council in Malawi. And um, he will talk a bit about how he views the new urban agenda, and in particular, um, to think a bit about um, how to align the new urban agenda with the Sustainable Development Goals, the Sendai Agreement, COP21, and other national international agreements. Costly. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you. I'll continue for where my colleague has stopped. Uh, I think so much has already been said about the urban agenda, that in 2016, uh, in Quito, the urban agenda was rolled out to provide guidance and recommendations for sustainable urban development for the next two decades, that's up to 2030. Uh, this urban agenda will guide all efforts around the urbanization of a wide range of actors, nation states, city and regional leaders, international development funders, international programs and civil society for the next 20 years. Inevitably, this agenda will also lay a groundwork for policies and approaches that will extend and impact far into the future. Uh, now, when we're dealing with urban agenda, 
we should also realize that urban agenda is not in isolation. There are other agreements that are also standing on the podium. Um, these other agreements include FI, FFD, like Financing for Development, Sustainable Development Goals. We've also got the United Nations Framework for Climate Change. We've got COP21. All these, in one way or the other, will affect the urban agenda. Now, for us to improve, to ensure that there's success in the urban agenda, we need to see what is already on the ground and see how best we can align them. My colleague has already mentioned about resources which are vital towards implementation of the urban agenda. Now, if we can try to align them with the existing agreements, somewhere we may succeed. But if we pursue urban agenda in isolation, then it's bound to have so many problems when we get up to 2030. Now, I'll be looking at these linkages, how we should fetch forward urban agenda. Uh, I also look at what are the successes and shortcomings with respect to the implementation of the urban agenda and what measures are needed to support an effective implementation of the new urban agenda. The financing mechanisms, do we have them? What should we do? <clears throat> now, how should these sustainable development goals address urban issues at the level of goals, targets, and indicators? How can the new urban agenda build on the ag agenda 2030 and it complement to it to ensure effective implementation? There are also lessons that we need to learn from the habitat agenda, urban monitoring platforms, and other international agreements with respect to the obstacles and requirements for effective monitoring, review, and support mechanisms. Now, what are the potential synergies between the new urban agenda and existing monitoring and review mechanisms? Uh, what do we need? What needs to be done? The urban agenda needs to be an inspirational vision to guide sustainable urban development and mobilize actors. We all know that the existing agreements that we have on the ground, they have got so much that is also appearing in the urban agenda. So the opportunities for successful new urban agenda, we need to look into that linkage with sustainable development goals to be thoroughly examined. Since sustainable development goals touch on urban issues, local actors need to be strengthened so that they can support implementation of the SDGs through adequate capacities at the city level, financing mechanisms, and national urban policy frameworks. There's also need for strong monitoring and review mechanisms to support the implementation of the new urban agenda. Uh, I've talked about uh, the sustainable development goals that they normally use uh, local actors. Now, if the new urban agenda is to be successful, we also need to follow the same. Most of the governments, local governments, institutions, they are touching on many issues in the sustainable development goals. So the same framework should also be aligned side by side with the new urban agenda to ensure that some of the issues that they are in the sustainable development goals to be achieved, they should also affect directly the new urban agenda. So the local players that we have on the ground could be city councils, local government, non government organizations, and other players who should be empowered to ensure that by succeeding in the other documents on the ground, other programs on the ground, the same, they should also have an impact on the new urban agenda. Now, I'm, talking, I'm looking at the potential that the new urban agenda can provide a comprehensive knowledge base and policy framework for urban development directly addressing urban stakeholders. However, there are also risks that we need to look into. New urban agenda might not be relevant beyond the urban community in some circles because political attention of UN member states may be captured or may have been consumed by the, urban, by the agenda 2030 or the COP21. So, as I said, we're not operating in isolation. There are also other players who would like to get attention from the general world. Monitoring, review, and support of Urban Agenda 2030 will absorb all available resources and may generalize the new urban agenda. Local authorities may be squeezed out from the agenda 2030 follow-up. So what are, the, what are the potential areas that we need to look into? We should complement the very limited and fragmented approach of Urban Agenda 2030 towards integrated urban development. Improving ownership of the SDGs through the involvement of local urban stakeholders, such as city administrations, urban networks, and non-state actors, including NGOs, business academia, etc., in policy recommendations of the new urban agenda. In short, they should go side by side. 
We also need to bolster the role and responsibility of the cities and local urban sectors by recognizing their indispensable contribution to achieving all the SDGs. The other risk that also need to look into is that seeded development, uh, sustainable development goals, indicators, writing process is likely to be, to be delinked from new urban agenda drafting process. The current urban agenda process may lead to a fragmented and highly specific expert discussions. There may also be a lack of political will, advocacy, resources, and preparedness to handle all the complexity of urban development. So in short, we need to align the new urban agenda with the existing programs on the ground to ensure success. Thank you. Mr. Edgardo Bilski is the Director of Research for United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG. And uh, they just had their uh, major conference in Bogota, um, just preceding Habitat 3. And I'd like to ask Edgardo to uh, talk a bit about how UCLG and their efforts, in particular their World Summit, helped prepare for Habitat 3, and what the results of that event were, and how you see, in particular, your organization um, will advance the new urban agenda. And Edgardo will be speaking in Spanish. This is not a problem for you that if I speak in Spanish for most of you, okay? Then we move to Spanish, please. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Um, como me han presentado, tengo el honor de representar aquí a la Organización Mundial de Autoridades Locales, Ciudades y Gobiernos Locales Unidos, cuya sede está aquí en Barcelona, que ha venido trabajando muy estrechamente con Naciones Unidas, particularmente con Habitat 3, eh, UN Habitat, en la preparación de la conferencia de Quito, pero también en todo el proceso de preparación de todos los grandes acuerdos internacionales que han sido mencionados, ya SDGs, ODD, eh, los acuerdos de Addis Abeba sobre el financiamiento del desarrollo, Sendai Framework for eh, Resilience. Eh, entonces, lo que nos parece importante destacar que lo, mi introducción, lo que voy a intentar ahora presentarles, no es solamente la posición de CGLU, sino una coalición de todas las organizaciones mundiales y regionales de autoridades locales que han estado trabajando conjuntamente durante todos estos años a través de lo que se dio en llamar la Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments, que representa a todas las organizaciones de gobiernos locales eh, existentes, reconocidas a nivel internacional. Cabe destacar que en este largo proceso de tres, cuatro años de colaboración, uno de los momentos cúlmenes y que fue organizado ex profeso fue la segunda, el congreso de CGLU en Bogotá, pegado, back to back, como se dice en inglés, eh, a Habitat 3, para preparar el posicionamiento de las autoridades locales en Quito. Y en el marco de eso se realizó, la imagen que tienen ustedes ahí, la segunda asamblea mundial de autoridades locales y regionales, que como verán, quizás reconozcan alguna de las figuras en la foto, reúne a los principales líderes mundiales, tanto de grandes como de ciudades medianas, de asociaciones de municipios, de presidentes de regiones, de la mayor parte de las regiones del mundo, que estuvieron presentes en Quito, este, en una asamblea que fue presidida por Ban Ki-moon, por Joan Clos, en tanto que eh, secretario, eh, director ejecutivo de Habitat 3 y el representante del gobierno de Ecuador. En este, eh, en este evento, las autoridades locales tomaron una posición común respecto a la agenda de Habitat 3 este, y se posicionaron en general frente a todo el debate internacional sobre las principales agendas de desarrollo. Considerando que, como lo ha señalado el colega de Blantyre, las, agencias, las agendas de desarrollo hoy día forman un conjunto que difícilmente se puede diversificar. No se puede hablar de la agenda urbana sin referir a los CDD, no se puede hablar de los ODD y de la agenda urbana sin referir a las políticas de financiamiento que fueron adoptadas en Addis Abeba en julio de 2015. Por lo tanto, hablamos siempre de las agendas de desarrollo, no solamente de la nueva agenda urbana, como un conjunto compatible y complementario. En ese sentido, esta adopción, el año, el año 2015-2016, marca una inflexión en las políticas de desarrollo, en las políticas multilaterales. Es la primera vez que la comunidad internacional adopta este conjunto magno de agendas donde se plantea 
una nueva transformación de los modelos de desarrollo para la humanidad, tanto de producción como de consumo, en un momento además en que por primera vez la mayor parte de la humanidad, como también se ha destacado, vive en las ciudades y que en las próximas dos, tres décadas va a pasar del 50%, 54% de la humanidad prácticamente al 66% de la humanidad que va a vivir en ciudades tanto grandes, medianas como pequeñas. Sí. Ahí tienen un breve mapa recordatorio que hoy día la mayor parte de la humanidad en población urbana vive, en, por un lado, el 41% en áreas metropolitanas, el 36% en ciudades intermedias y el resto en ciudades pequeñas. En el mapa solo vence en la edad a las ciudades grandes, las ciudades metropolitanas y las ciudades intermedias. Esto es parte de un esfuerzo que hemos desarrollado que se llama el informe de descentralización y democracia local de las ciudades que presentamos en Habitat 3. Luego, entonces, si estamos viviendo un momento de transición fundamental para la humanidad, que implica no solamente un cambio en, el, en las formas de hábitat de la humanidad, sino un cambio cultural, una transformación de la visión que tiene la humanidad y de su posicionamiento en el mundo y frente a la naturaleza. Y que estas agendas están íntimamente relacionadas, se trata entonces no solamente de pensar una agenda que pueda ser desarrollada desde los estados, ni siquiera solo desde las ciudades, sino que requiere una colaboración, una alianza muy estrecha de todos los actores que conforman las políticas de desarrollo, tanto gobiernos nacionales, organismos internacionales, gobiernos locales como las comunidades. Nosotros agrupamos este concepto en una alianza que llamamos a co-crear, es decir, a trabajar conjuntamente en la construcción de la nueva agenda urbana, en la implementación de la nueva agenda urbana. O sea, co-crear las ciudades y el futuro urbano. Creemos que desde las ciudades y territorios donde están emergiendo experiencias novedosas, innovadoras, transformadoras, que realmente pueden contribuir de forma más radical a implementar esta ambiciosa agenda de transformación de los modelos de producción y de consumo. Muchos de ustedes han escuchado hablar de los esfuerzos que están realizando desde muchas ciudades para implementar las políticas de eh, cambio o de adaptación, de adaptación y mitigación del cambio climático, mejoramiento de transportes, de edificación, políticas de inclusión social, políticas de respeto de la diversidad cultural y sobre todo políticas de implementación y respeto de los derechos humanos. Creemos y hemos hecho un, una argumentación muy fuerte para colocar el concepto del derecho a la ciudad como uno de los temas centrales de la nueva agenda urbana. Se lo menciona, y esto ha sido un logro importante de parte de la comunidad internacional, tanto de la sociedad civil como de los gobiernos locales y de muchos gobiernos que han luchado por eso, pero es necesario profundizarlo y desarrollarlo. El concepto del derecho a la ciudad implica no solamente el respeto de los derechos, sino el acceso a servicios básicos, a una vivienda decente, la profundización de la democracia local, está en el corazón del concepto mismo de co-crear las ciudades y territorios. Entonces, creemos que es el derecho a la ciudad el que puede servirnos de guía, de orientación, para crear lo que nosotros convocamos, llamamos a un nuevo contrato social entre las autoridades locales y la ciudadanía para, construir, para realizar este cambio tan profundo que aspiramos todos. En ese sentido, ¿cuál es el balance que sacan las autoridades locales de esta nueva agenda urbana? En primer lugar, un reconocimiento, o sea, es, eh, eh, que reconocemos que en la agenda se vuelve a reconocer el papel de las autoridades locales en las políticas de desarrollo, en el, sobre todo en su papel en el seguimiento y la implementación de esta nueva agenda urbana. Se eh, saluda también el, el reconocimiento del principio de descentralización, autonomía local, en el cual los gobiernos nacionales se comprometen a seguir adelante en la implementación de estos principios bajo el principio de subsidiariedad. Impulsar políticas urbanas inclusivas, participativas, nuevas formas de cooperación con la sociedad civil y los gobiernos locales, establecer un marco legal e institucional basados en los principios de igualdad, no discriminación, reforzar la capacidad de los gobiernos locales y su participación en la toma de decisiones, la necesidad de reforzar la coordinación y la cooperación entre los diferentes niveles de gobierno a través de mecanismos de consulta multinivel, definir claramente las competencias y los recursos de cada uno de los niveles de gobierno. Y asimismo, 
El reconocimiento del papel de las autoridades locales a través de la Asamblea Mundial de Gobiernos Locales, cuya imagen les mostré, les mostré hace unos minutos, en el sistema de debate, de toma de decisión y sobre todo de seguimiento de la nueva agenda urbana. ¿Cuáles son los principios que desde los gobiernos locales quisiéramos profundizar? Es decir, empujamos para ir más allá de la adopción de esta nueva agenda urbana. Primero el principio de localización de todas estas agendas internacionales. Ya lo mencioné, el garantizar el derecho a la ciudad, adoptar un enfoque más estratégico, integral, en la planificación de las ciudades y territorios, promover la solidaridad entre territorios y no solo la competencia, promover un desarrollo económico más inclusivo, solidario y colaborativo, impulsar modelos de producción y consumo más sostenibles, integrar la cultura como un pilar del desarrollo sostenible, sostener la cooperación internacional entre ciudades y gobiernos locales en general. ¿Qué es lo que creemos que faltan en esta nueva agenda urbana? En primer lugar, ya lo dije, el reforzamiento del concepto del derecho a la ciudad como una guía y orientadora de las políticas de implementación de la nueva agenda urbana y sobre todo el debate sobre el financiamiento. Existe dentro de la agenda un capítulo ligado al financiamiento, pero que está más orientado a las políticas de descentralización fiscal, de, mo de movilización de recursos domésticos. Sin embargo, creemos, y así lo demuestra, llevamos 20, 30 años de procesos de descentralización en las diferentes regiones del mundo. Sin embargo, la brecha entre los procesos de descentralización y la implementación de las políticas de descentralización, justamente por falta o la debilidad de recursos, sigue siendo enorme. Entonces, la garantía para poder llevar adelante esta agenda, va a depender en mucho de la movilización del financiamiento. Y el problema en que nos enfrentamos es que el sistema de financiamiento, tanto multilateral, internacional como nacional, hoy día no responde con, con pertinencia a las necesidades de la implementación de estas agendas y de los gobiernos locales, lo que nosotros llamamos la localización. Por lo tanto, y ese es uno de los desafíos que tenemos enfrente y que queremos empujar desde los gobiernos locales, es trabajar sobre ver cómo podemos transformar los mecanismos de financiamiento, tanto a nivel nacional, local, como incluso internacional, para poder movilizar recursos internacionales al financiamiento de la localización de estas agendas. Y esa será una de las principales desafíos en la próxima etapa. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I especially like that idea of co-creating the future. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Nicholas Yu, who will talk a bit about um, implementation of the new urban agenda. Uh, Nicholas is with the Guangzhou, Guangzhou uh, Institute for Urban Innovation. Um, he's also um, an executive with CityScope and one of the co-chairs of the uh, GAP process, um, heading up the media effort for that. Nicholas. Thank you, Tom. Um, Well, I suppose my biggest claim to fame is that I participated in Habitat 1, 2, and 3. I think I was one of um, less than a dozen people who've done so. <laughs> and uh, we did have an excellent opportunity in Quito to take a group photo of those people who were in Habitat 1, 2, and 3. And looking at that photo, I can say I definitely will not wish to partake in Habitat 4. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, joke aside, the, what was the biggest difference between these three? Some differences were already mentioned. In Habitat 1, we had no dialogue between member states and other stakeholders. I was then representing the NGOs. I was representing uh, Swiss schools of architecture in Vancouver, and we were stuck on a campus many, many miles away from where the conference center was being taken. And uh, the conclusion of Habitat One is that we should do everything we can to slow down or arrest urbanization. By Habitat Two, I had already been working for UN Habitat for a number of years. Um, it was absolutely clear to us that we had to overcome this negative view of urbanization and that we had to give urbanization a positive twist to show governments, to show all the stakeholders that indeed urbanization can bring about a lot of benefits. And I think we were quite successful in doing that, and we were quite successful in bringing 
governments together with stakeholders, especially civil society and local authorities, in order to exchange views and engage in a dialogue. However, one actor refused to come to Habitat 2. I remember when I knocked on the door of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which is about 150 of the world's largest companies committed to sustainability, they told me in 1994 they were not interested in urban. So the biggest difference for me in Habitat 3 was that business came on board, and business came on board in a big way. And I think that has everything to do with the demographics, it has everything to do with the fact that in the next 35 years, humanity will most probably invest more money in human settlements than it has since the beginning of human history until the year 2000. So in the next 35 years, we expect the economies of the world to invest more money in human settlements than they have since the beginning of history. And that is, is both an encouraging, exciting prospect at the same time a very scary one. Because if we don't get it right, and I would argue if we don't get it right in the next five to seven years to really chart out a path for all of that investment, we are going to be in very, very deep trouble. So to answer your question directly, what are the challenges that we are facing in the implementation of the new urban agenda and the urban dimension of the SDGs? For me, the question is without a doubt, further to what you mentioned on financing, the second biggest challenge will be capacity building. I have been working with cities now for some 40 years of my career, and we are still faced in most of the cities in the world today, the smaller and intermediate cities, with a lack of capacity to plan, with a lack of capacity to project into the future, with a lack of capacity to mobilize human, technical, financial resources in order to do anything more than the traditional mandate of cities, which is to clean the streets, repair the potholes, make sure the traffic lights work, and pick up the garbage. All right. But that is not what we will need to implement a new urban agenda. We will need a different kind of beast. We will need a different kind of city, a city that's going to be proactive, a city that's going to be entrepreneurial, a city that will be is capable of harnessing all of the resources, energies of civil society, of the private sector and of industry. So I would argue that we have a very short period of time before us. We have about three to five years to chart out an implementation roadmap that will include an unprecedented amount of capacity building. Not only of local authorities, but of civil society, of all the stakeholders that were involved in the preparatory process. How do we work effectively together? And one of the things that is encouraging is that many of us who participated in the Habitat 3 preparatory process are already working towards that. And it was just a week before Quito, about 40 of us, 40 stakeholder groups met in London on uh, how we could create a scientific knowledge platform for the implementation of the new urban agenda. Uh, emulating a little bit what was done for UNFCC. How do we bring science, not just hard science, but also social science into the equation so that we can better inform the decision-making processes going forward? So that's a dialogue, that's a conversation that is already happening. It's a dynamic that is going to grow. We are bringing on board more and more academic research, think tanks, thought leader groups on how to collaborate on sharing knowledge. The first step is a very simple one. Who's doing what where? Right. We just simply don't have any clue right now. 
everybody's doing a little bit of research here, a little bit of knowledge generation here, a little bit of capacity building there, but we do not have a map of what everybody is doing around the world, and we need to make that map very quickly. The second thing that I am working now very closely with UCLG, Metropolis, but also other stakeholder groups, is we know that the SDGs have come up with a series of quantitative indicators for monitoring their implementation. All right. National statistical offices were asked by the UN Commission on statistics to come up with a set of indicators for each one of the 180 or so targets. There's about 350 indicators out there. Now these indicators are going to be useful for national governments to monitor how well they're progressing in achieving the goals and the targets, the SDGs, right? But that, is that sufficient? And I believe, and I posit that it isn't, what we need today more than ever is a system where different stakeholder groups, primarily local authorities, private sector, and civil society organizations can share not quantitative indicators, but how they are implementing the new urban agenda, how they are translating the SDGs into transformed realities on the ground. And that, that has to happen in real time. Right. So how do we get people to tell their stories in real time to each other? Because uh, one of the dreams I have is that you can actually go onto the internet, we have information communication technology can help us today, and say, I live in city X and I'm facing this problem. Who in the world has already been tackling or has tackled successfully this problem and let's learn from each other. So I would just like to conclude there saying that one very important step forward will be creating a global knowledge base, knowledge sharing, expertise sharing, experience sharing platform so that we can go forward uh, with knowing what everybody else knows. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. And by the way, I'm sorry, I might have to leave a little bit earlier because I have another speaking engagement. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And our last speaker is Sri Hwasnaini Safjan. Sri is the Senior Program Administrator and Strategist with the WARU Commission for Women, Homes, and Community. I had the pleasure of meeting Sri through um, a group of civil society organizations that were preparing for Habitat 3, and then had the opportunity to work with Sri on our world stage and other activities. I'm thrilled that you're here to talk to the issue of civil society groups and what role they've played to develop the new urban agenda. And I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about what you hope the new urban agenda will produce for civil society groups, in particular for women um, and for other organizations that have not been at the table in previous discussions. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think this is an opportunity um, to actually share, not only from the civil society, but I think I would like to specifically mention about you know, the women. Uh, I represent the women, and the Huayru Commission is a partner uh, in the um, process of Habitat 3, uh, representing the women group. Uh, but within women itself, <coughs> we have um, stakeholders from all other civil society groups. You know? uh, we have grassroots women, indigenous people, farmers, youth, academia, researchers, and all that. So in that thing, I speak on behalf of all the civil society. Now, the, um, specifically on the women, because uh, I think this time, um, the uh, new urban agenda make a lot of reference to gender responsive. You know, that word is very important. It's not gender sensitive because gender sensitive is just sensitive. But responsive is actually urging you to take action, to make things happen that could bring gender equality and women's empowerment in the process for, uh, for us to uh, implement the new urban agenda and to achieve sustainable development goal number 11. Yeah? 
uh, because the new urban agenda is actually about implementation of the uh, SDG number 11, but bringing also the intersectionality with other SDGs, including SDG number five, which is, which is gender equality and women's empowerment. Now, um, during the um, Habitat Tree um, con conference, in fact, before the Habitat Tree conference, we have the uh, Women Assembly. And the Women Assembly, um, we have 1,000 participants uh, from at least 40 countries participating in that Women Assembly, a one-day affair. And in that um, assembly, the women highlighted nine key thematic areas within the new urban agenda that, uh, that, is, they are, that are important to them in terms of implementation, uh, monitoring, and making sure that you know, we achieve the new urban agenda as a whole. Yeah? So those uh, areas are women's political agenda and representation in urban uh, decision-making, women's economic empowerment, decent job agenda, unpaid care and domestic work, and women in the informal economy, city safe for women, which means that you know, safe for public spaces from free um, of violence, promoting grassroots women's leadership and agenda, uh, recognizing and resourcing rural urban links, securing access to and control over land, property and housing, taking leadership on the environment, climate change and resilience, designing, planning and monitoring gender responsive cities and securing women's life and opportunity in post-conflict contexts, including refugees. And that last point usually is a point that many people forget, but this is very uh, important. Uh, as you all know right now, yeah. Now, in this in this conference, you know, the challenge is how do our technocrats actually help create or help support the um, the enabling environment for us to achieve what we want in the urban new urban agenda? Because we all have our desires, we all have our want, we have our action. So now I, I bring a challenge to all of you, the technocrats out there. You know, the women has identified five action. You know, and the women represent all the um, the cross sector of a uh, stakeholders group, the civil society. And this is linked also with what Nick was mentioning just now about having a space for um, an urban solution that you know real time solution on, and all that. You guys are very smart in ICT. You know, how do we do that? How do we get that to happen? Yeah, uh, I think we have, you know, somebody from Smart City uh, that uh, work in China that has like work with 100 cities. You know, how does it, how do you make this happen? You know, and how do you make this to empower women and their communities? Um, you know, when we want to, um, develop and make available to all city knowledge, tools, and lessons from successful practices. That's what Nick mentioned just now. Um, promote initiatives that recognize women and girls as essential agents of change in a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral, and multi-level partnership um, informed by existing global frameworks of safe cities free of violence against women and girls and, um, and also, you know, the need for public space. Um, promote holistic, sustainable, resilient development through integrated approach, linking the conservation of natural resources, disaster and climate resilience to building sustainable livelihood for urban and rural communities. Establishing women's platform and network to exchange best practices on resilience building in conflict and post-conflict situation between women's group and also with other supporting group. I mean, these are some of the action. But, um, you know, with the technology, you can help make this process and action efficient, effective. And we talk about resources. So resources is not only money, but if you bring a technology that could help bring all this and get us to implement and achieve what we want as we list and as we desire in the new urban agenda, that's what we want. Thank you. Thank you, Sri.
A number of the questions that were raised um, through the ask and vote actually have been answered, including issues about implementation, measurements, um, about the topics negotiated, and the whole place of smart policies uh, in this discussion. Um, are there any qu quick questions from the audience? We have about two minutes. Yes, please, come to the microphone. Identify yourself if you wouldn't mind. Hi, I'm Kira from the university here in Barcelona, and I would like to know a bit more which is the paper of culture and maybe even landscape in this new urban agenda related with all the other challenges. So if I understand the question correctly, the question of landscape and how design will fit into the new urban agenda? And culture, yes. Okay. The, the new, can I, may I in Spanish? Yes. Okay. The, la nueva agenda urbana, es un, el tema de planificación en particular, eh, ocupa un lugar muy amplio en la agenda y está relacionado no solamente con la planificación urbana, sino con la planificación territorial, con el ordenamiento territorial. Por lo tanto, el tema de el plan del plan del ordenamiento territorial de la planificación en un sentido más amplio, del landscape, es una parte y dimensión importante de la agenda. También se reconoce en ella el tema de cultura como una parte integrante de la agenda. Sin embargo, eh, desde la perspectiva de los gobiernos locales en particular, nosotros planteamos que eh, ambas dimensiones, y en particular lo que hace al eh, tema cultura, debe ser u, ocupar un lugar central, dada la importancia que tienen las ciudades en la integración, en la, en la promoción de la diversidad cultural. La diversidad cultural es parte de la riqueza de las ciudades, es parte, lo que nosotros llamamos, de uno de los grandes pilares de desarrollo, junto al desarrollo económico, junto al desarrollo medioambiental, junto al desarrollo social. La integración, la inclusión cultural debe ser uno de los puntos centrales de la agenda y por eso nosotros hemos llamado a implementar lo que llamamos la Agenda 21 de la Cultura, como una de las dimensiones importantes de las políticas urbanas, como parte de las políticas de inclusión social. No sé si... If you want to... Thank you, Ron. In, in terms of the, uh, the issue of culture, I think um, the new urban agenda takes into account, and if we really see it, that there's a very strong statement in terms of culture, not in terms of just the historical cultural ar artifacts, but culture in all its dimensions, in, in terms of human beings, in terms of their interaction, in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their living. So it's a very broad aspect of culture. And um, what it also highlights, the new urban agenda, in terms of, and we had very strong inputs uh, from um, UNESCO in this. And as a matter of fact, one of the feedback they did, they, they had a uh, big conference, and you, you may wish to go into their website in terms of even they produced a book. They had a big conference in Hangzhou in terms of highlighting the importance of culture in the new urban agenda. <clears throat> so the new urban agenda takes into account the issue of culture in terms of its very broad dimensions. And <clears throat> it's, a, it's a proponent, it's a kind of a, uh, something which has been accepted in the new urban agenda in terms of giving action and giving, uh, <clears throat> taking inspiration from culture in all its dimensions. And what got me so excited about the new urban agenda, particular about Habitat 3, was about two years ago I had a dinner um, and I had a conversation with Dr. Close, the uh, Secretary General of UN Habitat, who started talking about the Congress of Athens. So those of you who know Dr. Close, of course, uh, former mayor of Barcelona, um, radiologist by training, um, now is heading up UN Habitat, is starting to talk about the seminal document that architects um, swear by. And I just found that fascinating. Well, the Congress of Athens, for those who may not know, was developed in the 1920s and 1930s by Le Corbusier and other architects who sailed around the Greek islands and developed this manifesto, if you will, about how cities should be designed. And many of our cities around the world followed principles in the, that were developed in the, the, the uh, Charter of Athens. Um, 
And yet we see today cities don't work according to many of those precepts going through. Um, and it, whether it's culture, whether it's climate, whether it's economics. Um, and so we need a new um, manifesto, if you will, a new Congress um, to actually put together this uh, charter going through. And um, I understand um, that people like Richard Sennett, Saskia Sassen, and others are engaged in actually helping to develop what could be a new charter to actually help advance. So anyone in the audience has an interest in landscape, in design, in culture, we ask you to stay tuned, be involved, um, and be engaged in the new urban agenda. I'd like to close our conversation and ask each of the panelists to answer this question. Uh, the next step for many of us is to look to where will we be in a year or two? How do we start measuring the effects of the new urban agenda? And many of us are anticipating World Urban Forum 9 in Kuala Lumpur in, in uh, February of 2018. Um, so at that event, it will be another opportunity to engage mayors and other urbanists uh, following Habitat 3. What do you expect out of World Urban Forum 9? And what plans are being made to ensure that it moves the agenda of advancing um, the Sustainable Development Goals and COP21 agreements. So maybe, Kumarish, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about what you anticipate World Urban Forum 9 will be from the UN Habitat standpoint, and then we could ask um, the other panelists what would they like to see come out of World Urban Forum 9, and how do we start holding mayors and others accountable to actually sign agreements and implementation devices to make the new urban agenda a reality? Now, the World, the World Urban Forum, of course, is, is seen as a first step in terms of taking stock of what actions should be taken towards implementing the new urban agenda. But prior to that, a <clears throat> couple of things are also happening. If you really look at the new urban agenda, there is going to be a dialogue in the 71st session in terms of towards implementation, the role of UN Habitat, in terms of the progress that you are making. Again. In, in the next General Assembly, in the, in the 72nd session, there is again going to be a dialogue in terms of the role and responsibilities and financing of new and habitat. So in terms of this is a preparatory process towards implementation in terms of the World Urban Forum. In addition, as <clears throat> Mr. Lau had um, mentioned, is in terms of the issue of measurement, in terms of achievement. So that is also going to happen. So in terms of my assessment, what, what I see, that in terms of the development of urbanization, two years is a very short time to make an impact. But two years is sufficient time to prepare in terms of plan, identify in terms of your goals, identify your measurements, as was mentioned, that yes, <clears throat> the sustainable development agenda would have certain measurement for, for uh, goal number 11. That may not be sufficient for all national level. It may not be sufficient for the municipal level or the regional level. So we might have to deal with additional kind of measuring measurements so that we can ensure that we deliver it. So there are still a number of steps. So I, I, my own sense is that the World Urban Forum would be an excellent platform in terms of having everything ready. People, the way they prepared the national reports, now perhaps they'll have their national implementation plans, the regional Great. implementation plans, the local implementation plan, and, and some of the issues that have been raised uh, in terms of financing, in terms of measurement, I think we should have the answers so that we, we start off well and we keep running. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think he, I'll repeat what I've said earlier on, that uh, between now and the time we have the World Urban Forum, it's quite important for us to do the housekeeping issues. We need to align the new urban agenda with other international agreements. I've talked about sustainable development goals, I've talked about COP21, and so on and so forth. Most of these agreements, they're also touching so many issues that are found in new urban agenda. So it's worthwhile linking up with them so that we shouldn't repeat some issues and also to ensure that we have success on the new urban agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Kost. I agree what, with my previous colleagues uh, said. Nevertheless, I think one of the big challenges that we'll be facing in the coming years to keep the political momentum, the policy momentum. We're facing now a, a new challenges at the global level. And I think what do we, one of the key issues in the coming years is to keep the alliance that we build toward Habitat 3, that means 
national governments, local governments, civil society, all the social movements, the people that uh, mobilize for the right to the city, the, popul the people that mobilize for the same housing, etc., to bring them again together to Kuala Lumpur to push, to keep moving this more policy moment. If not, the probably the problem we will lost this expectation that we built on the last year. That is the first issue. Then, yes, we need to take stock, but uh, taking stock means also continue to building awareness, to build, to mobilize new people to bring into the agenda. Because even if I say that there was a big mobilization, at least from the uh, side of local authorities, uh, local authorities are millions of local governments in the world, and the number of local governments that were involved in this uh, process is still limited. Then we need to still build, uh, uh, to train, to develop, to have discussions at national and regional levels to involve local authorities and to build the momentum with national governments. We talk about the need to integrate, to build multi-level dialogues. This is still to be done in many countries. And this is related not only to the urban agenda, it's even more a priority for the SDGs. You see, if not the implementation, if the implementation of the SDGs not involve all the civil society, all stakeholders, they will be only a paper. And that means that we need to build in each country a national dialogue, I don't know, a national forum mechanism we can build of the examples of different countries, for example, Colombia, or uh, some discussion that are now in beginning in South Africa, how to bring national governments, local authorities, civil society in all their movements to discuss how we implement the all this agenda, SDGs, new urban agenda, and for the, our point of view, how we need to localize, how we need to involve local authorities and stakeholders at the local level to make it a reality. That is the first. I can, one issue of the financing, maybe, because see, our, my colleague, sorry, he's not here, said that there is a big expectation of mobilization of finance sector, private sector toward financing urban issues. Yes, probably yes, but the, one of the key issues is if we, uh, contrast with the experience of this last year, there was a lot of financing in urban issues, but on speculation, on land, on land, uh, compra de tierras, how you say, on land uh, uh, market. And there it was not on basic issues. One of the big problems that mo overall least developed countries are confronted that they have not investments in basic service, in access to water, access to sanitation, most of the big cities in the world have not access for most of the population so, so, uh, on sanitation. And this is critical for the future. Yes. Not uh, planning is critical, but access to basic services is, is, is uh, need to be consolidated with the, the, with the planning issues. Then, uh, and the other issue is related to finances, is how to make this financing more sustainable. Because if they continue to invest in the way they invest in the last uh, half century, that we are going to confront to a, a new big problem in the sustainability of these policies. Thank you very much. Just um, to link up with what my colleague from UCLG is saying, um, the, for us, for, I'm, here I'm speaking about the grassroots women, you know, because the uh, Huaru Commission works with them. So for us, in the next one year, we want to make sure that the grassroots women are organized and to have this um, partnership with their local government. The thing is that we recognize or we found out that there are grassroots women coming from cities that are not aware of the new urban agenda because their mayors may not be actively participating in the association of local authorities, may not be you know, part of the UCLG or the metropolis and so on. The, so for us is to make sure that um, the, um, these women leaders organize their community and then engage with their local government, engage with the other uh, stakeholders. And we want to use the Urban Thinkers Campus, a continuation of the uh, uh, one activity of the World Urban Campaign, a program of UN Habitat to actually highlight this and to make sure the momentum of, uh, like you said, 
keep the momentum and make people aware that this is as important and continue um, to be, you know, in the minds of the people and in the program of their work. Thank you. So the simple message for all of you is in order to ensure the implementation of the new urban agenda, it's up to you. Um, many of us around the table have given our all and we will continue to give our all, but we're not alone and we're not enough. And we need you to be engaged. So we ask you to do whatever you can. Please go online, go to nextcity.org slash habitat number three. You'll find out more about our coverage of UN Habitat and Habitat process and the new urban agenda. Please go to the UN Habitat site um, I recommend that you also uh, contact your city mayor, um, contact your town planner and others. Start raising the question, how are you involved in the new urban agenda? Uh, work with the UCLG and a number of the other organizations that advance um, the local interests, city's interest in particular. Um, and as Sri has indicated, um, all of us are in this together and we have various groups that we're engaged with also. Make sure that what we're talking about is inclusive, equitable, sustainable, resilient, something that we want to leave our children and grandchildren. And I do want to end with uh, Nicholas's note that for the first time ever, we are truly in an urbanized society and we need to change the perceptions um, about cities. Uh, Barcelona is a great example of how cities can really grow and can thrive and how people make the difference. And so all of us need to learn these lessons and move them forward so that when Habitat 4 comes, and I intend on being there, um, <laughs> It's going to be a celebration um, and that what we can do is actually track the progress we've made so that we do truly leave our children and grandchildren a better place than we found it. Thank you all very much and we appreciate your time. Thank you, Thank panelists. You.